Hello and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today I am speaking to Maria Ginyasu, who is a qualified psychologist from Argentina with a master's degree in developmental psychology from UCL. Now Maria trained at the Tamalpa Institute in California, which is the internationally recognized training center for movement-based expressive arts therapy. Maria's work is grounded in the Tamalpa life art process, which was created by a lady called Anna Halprin, who used this in her own healing. Maria uses a variety of tools that engage movement, dancing, drawing, and creative writing, which help people to overcome disordered eating and feeling dissociated from their bodies. So she encourages people to explore a new and healthier relationship between their bodies, emotions, thoughts, and imagination. Maria has worked at the Amy Winehouse Foundation, where she gave support through this therapy to women recovering from addictions and eating disorders. She also collaborates remotely with an eating disorder outpatient centre in Argentina. And at the moment, she is studying counselling and psychotherapy at Middlesex University. Whilst alongside her studies, she is working with the Oasis Project in Brighton, where she works with women struggling with eating disorders, addictions and body image issues. So I'm really looking forward to this interview with Maria today because it's something quite new for me. My background is much more sort of training and more sort of traditional therapy, working with the mind and much less so with the body. But I really understand how valuable this is and how for many people it's been such an important part of their healing. So I'm really looking forward to this. Let's get to the interview. Hi, Maria. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Harriet. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Great. So Maria, could you just introduce yourself, please, to the listeners? Sure. So my name is Maria. I'm from Argentina and I came to the UK 10 years ago. I'm a qualified psychologist from from Argentina and I came here with the intention to sort of find a place to to connect my passion with movement and also the psychology and I got involved in so many courses and then I found a lot of passion around like eating disorders and moving the arts as a way to heal and then very organically I came across with a school in America in California called Tamalpa that was created by Anna Halprin and her daughter, Daria. And I went there in 2018. And the reason when I went there, it's because I, that was the year that I lost my mom and it was very unexpected. Mm-hmm. And I sort of like started getting a lot of, a lot of questions around myself, around my body, around like, who am I? I was 29 years old. So I was like finishing my twenties. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and that was such a special time for me because I find it like that sort of reconnection with my body, connecting with my with my eating, with my food, with with a whole like sort of like a different way to see my well-being. And that also helped me a lot to show up for my clients and the people that I was working with at the moment, the teenagers that I was supporting, young people. And then very organically, I I got this job at Amy Winehouse Foundation in Hackney, East London. And then I had the opportunity to start putting everything together. And I designed a program for these girls that were recovering from eating disorders and addictions. And well, that was that was a very special experience because it, it feels like it, it was a I feel a bit like a bridge, if you want to put it like that, connecting all my my passions. And then now I'm in, in a women-only service where I'm like developing this program and, yeah, and, and encouraging women to find a way to heal through their bodies when it comes to, well, eating disorders, addiction mainly, but also tapping into trauma. Yeah, I hope that was like... Mm. Oh, well, thank you for sharing your story. And, you know, I'm so sorry to hear about the loss of your mum because I'm sure that must have, you know, just been such a, a grief yeah. to deal with. 
that yeah that was the most typical experience that I have had in my life and a movement the arts yeah like the curiosity towards like who do I want to be in my 30s as well and and what's home you know because like mm. it all happened when I was in the UK and of course like all my family's in Argentina so then it was just a sort of like an existential question and so that's why I found it really healing this and that's why my intention is to support women to find these tools these resources that might they might resonate with them or not but I think the the self exploration is uh, something that I really encourage people mm yeah and it's sure well, it sounds like you you've really sort of drawn so much on your own personal experience mm-hmm. and the work that you've done I think as, as we often do but in a way to really sort of open up that opportunity to help heal others too yeah yes I feel like I'm really really happy that I went through this experience because that helped me a lot to understand like yeah like grief around body image around like a bit like what I said before, like, who am, yeah, like, who, who is Maria, you know, who's Maria Curry in this body? And I know that um, I love what you always said, Harry, around like finding peace with food. And, and that was a lot of my journey and also finding peace with like my body and finding like body as my home and grief. And as it could sound, it was my greatest teacher that helped me to find yeah, my body as that special container and temple that I really really honour these days. Mm, sure, that's so good to hear. So Maria, did you have sort of issues with eating and your body image sort of pre-2019 when you had the bereavement and everything? Is it something that you'd struggled with as a younger woman? Yes, yes. And thanks for asking that, Harriet. So when I was 16, I started, I was going through a lot of sadness around family. You know, like I have two other brothers that I love with all my heart. And, and we were living with my mom and there were a lot of things around the relationship with my dad. My dad was basically living in the same city, but not living with us. And for me, it was very difficult growing up with like my dad. You know, he was like not present physically probably as much as I would love to. And that sort of triggered a lot of insecurities and a lot of lack of confidence in my body. And, and I felt like, with the dancing that I was so passionate about, it turned into this sort of like performance. And then I felt like the only thing that I can do to make sure that I got my my place when I'm dancing, you know, when I'm dancing well, is to sort of restrain and, and be skinny. And what I started doing is basically stop eating. Like I developed, I developed like the beginning, I was said of like anorexia was a lot of restraint on my story. There was not like purging or binging, but it was a lot of restriction. And in a way, it was a bit of like punishing, you know, myself of like all these feelings and also trying not to feel a lot. And that's when it comes, the work that I'm doing at the moment is it's sort of taking that veil, you know, and tapping into those feelings and allowing that numbness to sort of fade away. And that's why I found this so powerful and how I see myself, because also I went to a very, I went to a school that I didn't feel that I belong. It was like a private school in Argentina. And I struggle a lot with my body image because it's like all my friends were like, the most beautiful women I have ever met in my life. And I always felt a bit like, oh, I'm not I'm not like that. And I know that now as someone who's 32 years old, I'm a bit like, what were you thinking? Why? Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you're a teenager, that plays such a massive part. And yeah, so, so the way that I found sort of, yeah, kind of deal with the situation was basically not eating and moving and moving and dancing and dancing. And that was a way to do my exercise as well. So then like dance ended up being this sort of soothing, yeah, this cathartic experience that it used to be when I was a kid, it ended up being a way as a form of exercise, you know? So it changed the whole connotation of like what dance means for me. Mm, Sure. Yeah. So it's so interesting, isn't it? So it sounds like it became then a bit compulsive and so focused around controlling your weight and shape. Whereas before perhaps it had been something you just really enjoyed and and loved for the, you know, just for the simple joy of the, the activity. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why 
my training at Tamalpa was so powerful because it helped me to redefine everything. And like you said, using movement as a way to connect with my feelings, with my, my emotions, the imagery. With, it's a lot of like symbolism, you know, so very positive and also hopeful. It gave me a lot of hope mm. to find peace. Sure. So how does it work? Can you tell us a bit more about like, how do you kind of like release your feelings? And you know, how do you find find this healing through the Tamalpa life art process? Perfect. Yeah, that, thanks for asking that. So the work that I do is I work one to one. And usually this is quite important to clarify the work that I do is for like, women that are on working around their body image, because you know, there's so much research around that it's so important to work body image to facilitate a treatment that could heal the person and also like preventing this relapse. So the work that I do is not around, it's not on the early stages, right? It's more around the treatment if we're talking about the proper eating disorders. But the work that I do is I always start with the first part of the body and I always start with legs and feet because to me it's like that grounding, you know, that, that grounded part of the body that help us feel that we are on earth. Yeah, we're touching this mother earth and how we're showing up on this, this planet. Yeah. So what, I, what we do, if we started like, I usually start with grounding exercise and kind of work around legs and exploring lots of different movements around that. That could be like running, walking, and the use of a space, probably we want to make like big steps. So small steps, yeah. We want to do it faster, slower, yeah. It feels like a bit more flowy or maybe could feel a bit more restrained. So it's just at the beginning, it's just looking at the physicality, like the physical body, yeah. And then slowly we start moving on to what are the associations that we have around this movement. So it will be like changing directions, yeah. And what does it mean to change directions? It could be about something that I love work and it's like, well, am I standing, you know? Am I, am I in, like, in the middle of the room? Well, I'm in the corner, you know? And how does it feel being in the corner? And how does it feel being in the middle of the room and getting all the attention, yeah? And, and I have found that kind of those movements that we do it all the, like unconsciously, you know, we're like moving and walking and running. And, but how does it feel tapping into the motion? Yeah. So that's mm. when we move on to another level. So we move from the physicality to more like the emotional part. Right. And then we move on to the mental. So we start looking at like metaphors, you know, taking my stand, for example, that's the theme that I usually work on. And what does it mean to take my stand? Yeah. How do I want, is something that I want to change, like about like the way that I was taking my stand before? So it's all around the personal mythology that my teacher always said. And it's all around like the story of every single person. And that's why I find it so beautiful because even though there are like these archetypes, you know, and this universal themes, we all process all these themes so differently. Mm-hmm. We have have you know that we have been told the story that we have lived so and then from all this movement exploration we move on to an image so the idea is to draw our legs and feet and the question that I always like to ask yet yeah, the women that I work with is like if your legs and feet could speak what would they say mm. and that's when it comes to like the movement and changing into the image and then we move on to a bit of like a poetic dialogue mm. And then after that, you know, after doing like what, what Tamapa calls the psychokinetic imagery process, looking at these three arts, types of, types of arts, it's like the multimodal art approach in a way, if you want to look at Tamapa, then we move on to another part of the body and we move on to the spine, before, right? Because I, the spine is like the one that carries us. And so how, how do we want to carry ourselves in this world? And then we move on to the rib cage and the rib cage is connected to the heart and the lungs. And when it comes to eating disorders, it's so powerful that part, right? Because there is this sense of like, you know, talking about more clinical terms, you know, the, the alexithymia, like that kind of like inability to put like the words to the feelings and emotions. So in a way, tapping to the rib cage is so powerful 
And then we'll move on to the shoulders, the arms, and the arms are also very important because it has the connotation of like reaching out, you know, and thinking about eating disorders, like sometimes how we end up being so strict. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anyone, you know, it was like my own secret. And people will ask me, why are you so skinny? And then I would just start like ignoring those questions, you know, walking away. So, so this is a bit of like the journey that we move on to all these different parts of the bodies. Mm, gosh, it's so interesting, isn't it? And I guess it's it just sort of it's coming at everything just from a very different perspective, isn't it? From you know more traditional therapy, but it sounds like as well because I think many people do struggle in the more traditional therapy session where you're sitting in front of a therapist and you're being encouraged to talk about your feelings and I guess often you can be really disconnected from your feelings but it sounds like through this process you're more sort of perhaps tapping into the unconscious and you know I guess just approaching it in a, in a different way so and as well it sounds like as well being able to kind of use sort of images and feeling how it feels in the body and using that sort of slightly different take on it to help people access their kind of inner voice and perhaps begin to discover things about themselves yeah yeah totally I personally have the feedback that I have had from, from a lot of women is that for some of them works so well because like you said and the talking therapy it could be quite daunting for some people or, or some people don't don't find the words to express themselves so then they create a sort of like frustration and a bit of like yeah not motivated to be part of that process so in a way this is like this is another resource that I like to add to the toolkit yeah this Mm -hmm. is by no means trying to say no talking therapists because like you know like I'm a psychologist from Argentina now I'm training now as a psychotherapist and counseling psychologist so I do believe in like what resonates with the client when it comes to this is is what matters yeah and in a way trying to complement this and using all the symbolism and like you said tapping into the unconscious and also something that is really interesting Harry that I, that I haven't mentioned is is the power of like witnessing mm. especially when we're doing like movement we can call it like dance I mean I, I follow the life up process but of course it's very connected to dance and movement therapy right how the power of being witness being seen and see others is so powerful and how that help us to connect to probably all those unconscious feelings and emotions. And I think what is also really beautiful, it helps us to, to understand that we don't have to be a professional dancer to do this. You know, we don't have to be an artist. Yeah. We just have to be willing to tap into our own mythology. And by being witness, how that could help us feel like we're being seen. And going back to eating disorders, like when I did this work and I felt like I was being seen by my teachers, by my, my classmates, it was so, oh, it was like, it's, it just gives, it gives me goosebumps, you know, it's group work is, so what we do is like when we get feedback to the other person, we usually do it in a way that we give a poem or we give an image back to the person. So how we, it's allowing ourselves to be moved when we witness someone going through their own material, their own personal material. And then we give back an image. One that is very common is a flower, you know, a tree. So how, how did we kind of, how do we feel after witnessing this? And there's no sort of like, I think you should do this. I think you should do that. None of that. It's all about sharing how I felt when I saw you. Mm-hmm. What I noticed mm. in my body when I saw you. Yeah, and no, sure. I mean, it sounds incredibly powerful, I think, doesn't it? Just to be really validated and seen. And I guess it's so common, isn't it, with eating disorders and other mental health conditions where people haven't always felt seen or, you know, and I'm not saying that's anyone's fault, you know, sometimes there's just so much going on in life, isn't there? But for whatever reason, maybe your needs were overlooked and to f- feel that you're so sort of truly seen and that's kind of held and contained by other people. I can understand why that would be like a real goosebumps feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's just like, especially, you know, sharing something quite personal. When I decided to go to California, whereas literally literally like six months mm-hmm. after my mom passed, and I remember my brothers also that they were like what are you doing what are you doing like you 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 might not be ready to put yourself in that situation and I guess this is a very personal thing because I 
I can imagine that it would have been totally different if I probably I will go now, you know, but, but it felt that that was the right thing to do. And there were lots of moments while I was doing my training that I felt myself a bit like, oh no, was it a good thing to do? You know, that's when you go into this mental, you know, the mental part of, of ourselves. And, but then my body was kind of giving me that clear sign to say like, trust, you know, it's going to make sense, just trust. And that was probably what I needed when it comes to grief and when it comes to also really finding myself as a motherless daughter and trusting that all the answers are in that temple, yeah. And what I also learned is with this experience and something that I talk a lot with my clients, with with these women is there's some situations that talking onto like trauma or childhood trauma is this work is so powerful because it, it gives us that sort of kind of that very gentle reminder to what about living, carrying these wounds awfully, you know? How about learning how to live with that scar and create art from that scar? And, and something that one of my best friends that I love dearly, told me one of the things that we have to learn when we go through like very powerful experience is turning tragedy into something beautiful. And I think that the life of process does that. The word tragedy is quite extreme, but in a way to say, Mm -hmm. turning something dark, the shadow into something beautiful. And it doesn't have to be nice, doesn't have to be pretty, it just has to be like healing. Sure. I think it's just so wonderful, actually, that, you know, because I guess at that time, it must have been quite a brave and scary decision, really, in a way to sort of follow your heart. (laughs) Because it sounds like in a way you you knew, didn't you, there was something in you in terms of you being aligned with you, you really felt this perhaps pull towards doing this life art process, even though perhaps it didn't make logical head sense. But I think it's just wonderful that you were able to trust that process and go with it. Yeah, 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 totally. And and now I'm so grateful because it has given me sort of a framework to support women and and has given me that sort of, has opened my eyes to, to tap into this creativity that we all have. And when it comes to body image and the self-worth, you know, and, and how we kind of start defining ourselves from a different place, not just around food, you know, or not just around how we see or how we think people see us. It's more around so many other different layers. And something that is really important that I work a lot with around how I own my story, you know, like owning my story and how can I also weave a different story every day. And that's what the life of process has taught me. And the way that I use it, you know, on a daily basis, because this is kind of the work, you know, that even though I did my training a few years ago, I still practice it nearly every day because I feel like I need to sort of tap into my body every day. And I have my my movement rituals that we used to call it in the, tra- in the training. And like Anna Halprin gave us this sort of, standard kind of an example that she uses but she always suggests like you need to try to like change it and make it your own movement ritual your movement or or morning ritual I do it in the morning because I'm a morning person and then I started I started sort of discovering that the movements that kind of resonate with me and something that she talks a lot is the hot spot and the hot spot it's literally like under your belly bottom and what I try to do is I try to imagine that that red energy, that hot spot that keeps me like that, that kind of force, you know, it's the life force that help us feel like, what do I want to do today? You know, how do I want to show up in this world? How do I want to support the women? How do I also want to like, sadly, you know, all my families in Argentina, so I haven't been able to see them, but when it comes to like my partner, you know, and I, I kind of try to tap a lot into like, how do I want to show up with, with the people around me and how the red spot is a bit of like a guidance. And also it helped us a lot to connect with my, with the spirit of my mom, you know, and like all my sort of women heritage. And mm. that has been an amazing resource that I feel that 
it's literally has I can call it a life changing experience. <laughs> mm, sure. Yeah, well, it sounds just, you know, it's just so incredible to hear, actually. And, you know, I think like most of these practices, like, we do the training, don't we? But then it's like an ongoing life journey to sort of, yeah, keep practicing and then to embed it and refine it and make it more of our own. And I love the way that you were saying about Anna Halperin, who was saying that you were in a way to make it your own as well. Because I think that's just such a wonderful thing, isn't it? Because I think as well, when you struggled particularly with an eating disorder or something, you often have really lost your sense of self. And being able to kind of become aligned with yourself again and trust yourself again is such a powerful part of healing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I know how kind of when we stop making things like putting our own shape to things that also, like you said, give us this sort of sense of worth and also it stop building a lot of trust. Something that I work a lot is around like the impulsive behaviors, right? And how we can also learn to sit in that uncomfortable feeling whenever we feel triggered yeah how we can sit in that feeling breathe into that use the body as an ally not as an enemy and that breathing that again it's a bit of like this light this life force can help us feel like you're safe you know you're safe you're fine and something that that I do whenever because you know I still feel a bit kind of my story around food and eating disorders is still quite like, you know, it's an ongoing journey, right, as well. And whenever I feel triggered, I, what I do is like I put my hand on my, on my chest and on my womb space and, and I breathe into that and I feel you're safe, you know. And that's a way of like, this is something that is not going to happen overnight. But every day I try to remind myself that just a simple touch and it's my own touch on my chest and on my belly can help me feel that, I'm safe, that I'm fine, that I don't need to do anything, then it's going to make me feel guilty or shame or worse. And I think that's a, that's a resource that it builds a lot with time. You know, it's like, I don't want to say it every day, but, you know, it's like sort of with time we see how it, start, how it starts working because it's not, it's not a quick fix. That's why. Yeah. Mm, sure. It's so helpful to hear. And I think, because I guess, if you struggled with them eating disorders, often those addictive behaviours become your kind of short term way of feeling safe, don't they? Yeah. But of course, they don't work because you have to like repeat them again and again and again to kind of keep yeah. getting that sort of fix almost. Whereas, yeah, obviously that, you know, with the sort of breathing and, and sort of touching base with your body, like you, you touching your body, it's a way of just feeling very grounded and safe. Totally. Yeah. And the movement, you know, like... Mm. Um, sometimes I, this is, could be like a very simple you know exercise that I do at home what I do is like I just basically sometimes stand up you know put the hand on my chest and my belly and then I start sort of like moving you know and swinging back from one side to the other and then my intention is to change that feeling that uncomfortable feeling that anxiety you know into something that could be that could be more a line of what I want today for my life, you know, and, and, and that harmony, that happiness, you know, try to remind myself my values and what do I want to choose now? And the movement can help me a lot with the movement and the imagery, right? And, and the metaphor, that, that kind of body metaphor to find that calm and peace and, yeah, and stay with it, stay with it. That's something that my teachers at Tamapa would always say, you know, stay with, uncom- with uncomfortable feeling and look for that transformation, yeah? Because sometimes what, what we don't do in eating disorders is, yeah, that staying with that feeling, you know? And I also work a lot with addictions and it's a bit of like the same process, right? And you see in that safe coping mechanism that's more that it's literally us you know but but sometimes we're not we're not taught about that or we don't know about it and it's something that we have to teach ourselves that in a way Mm -hmm. yeah and it's sure I mean I think for many people they're just afraid of their feelings aren't they afraid of kind of sitting with the feeling and it just being so overwhelming or they've just become so numb that they have no idea in a way what they're feeling. So it sounds like such a powerful process, I guess, doesn't it? Of like reconnecting with the body, reconnecting with yourself. Yeah, yeah. And something that is also very important is like, like I said before, we're all we're all different. So I have clients that are way, way more open than others, you know, and they're like willing to 
throw themselves into the deep end, but there are others that they're not, you know, and they need more time and, or they might be feel, feel a bit confused, like what's going on here, you know? Mm-hmm. And if you feel something that is really important is to, as, as someone who is supporting these women, I try to like listen, witness, and the idea is like, this is a gentle process. And Halprin talks a lot about them identifying what's going on. Yeah? And that the confrontation is when it comes to the enactment. And then it comes to the release, then the change, and then the growth. And the growth is forever, right? It's like an ongoing journey. Yeah, no, sure. So can you say a little bit more about Anna? And, you know, has she used this process with her own sort of healing? Is that kind of where it's all sort of stemmed from? Yeah, so... So this story goes back to the 70s in California. Yeah. So she she's now 100 years. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <It's> amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like having that, it's yeah, having the opportunity to talk with her and work with her was like such a gift. And her daughter Daria, she's also like a wonderful woman that I can only be grateful for, like all the support and help that I received from her, especially during my grief, right? So Anna is a trained dancer yeah, and she started in Wisconsin. She was trained there. And then she moved, well, she's originally from California. Yeah, she lives in California. And then she came up with this kind of ideas and process around like, what about mental movement? Yeah, going back to the, like the way that we used to dance before, you know, like how like, like all the tribes used to dance. Let's go back to that and, and forget about that sort of performance looking beautiful. And then, and she tapped into like all those kind of things that I feel it was really, really powerful. And also she made a lot of grounding work around like racial work and, and having a more like inclusive dance companies, which I think was really important. And also, well, the 70s, you know, was such a liberal, open-minded part, especially being in California. And that's mm. where she came to the hotspot. And, and then like progressively with her daughter, they, they came up with this program that now is widely known they have branches in the UK in Germany in France and the way also that it happened is that she was she was diagnosed with cancer Mm -hmm. and the movement the art the poetry as a way to heal from that and that doesn't mean she she did all that you know the chemotherapy so I I hope it doesn't like people Mm. don't I'm saying you don't have to do that it's this is more about not curing something it's more about the healing and that's such a beautiful work that she did around that and I know that because by, by the end of the program we created a two meter self-portrait so that's how the program finishes and Anna did that and she found that very healing so the self-portrait is a very powerful part of the training that I I have done it with a few clients. It takes time because in a way it's trying to put all the parts of the body together. But all her journey is around her curiosity, her interest in movement, but also around kind of how, how did it help her to heal from that on a spiritual, emotional and mental level. And to be honest with you, Harry, there is a part of me that wish I could have done this with my mom because my mom also died because of cancer. And so this is something that, I, in a way, when I was doing my own self-portrait, I felt that I was dancing with my mom in that, in that sense, so sharing with her. So I feel like this is something like her journey, Anna's help journey sort of also inspired me to think about healing levels of awareness, that they call it, the physical, the emotional, the mental, the spiritual. Yeah, it sounds so interesting, actually, isn't it? And it sounds like almost there was something about so right actually about you working with Anna wasn't there and perhaps yeah. her journey and then what she was able to teach you and then you being in that place and being able to kind of do that difficult work but also to sort of somehow share it with your mum yeah which sounds wonderful actually you know I'm sure I'm sure it must have been a very up and down process you know but it sounds as well that it's really helped you find some peace and feel some real connection with your mum as well through that whole process yeah totally and also like you know it was on this beautiful deck in marine county like in northern north north part of san francisco and this wooden deck that was designed by anna's husband who was a landscape architect so beautiful and surrounded by redwood trees and also something that i learned from this training is 
nature, yeah, the power of nature when it comes to this, this healing journey. So there are a few times that Daria would tell us like, go to the roots and find things that you like, that you want to make a part of your dance. So we just, it was like such a so playful experience to the woods or, or we went to a few yeah we went to the beach as well one day and try to like make your your dance yeah using things from mother nature and how does it feel that and how do you also can connect to other elements you know the wind the earth the fire within you the water when it comes to like the sea so it's also really healing because it helps us to go to our our basic sort of yeah like the basic nature, you know, like what matters to us, which I find it really interesting. And it helped me also see nature in a different way and looking mm. at the details and the curiosity because in the end, all this journey is a, it's an exploration and it's a self-exploration. What's happening in our bodies, in our mind, but also what's happening around us, you know, and what's happened, like how do we show up in like, people, but also with nature. So, so for me, it's, it's it suits very well because it looks at the whole picture, if that makes sense. Sure. Now, I think it's so helpful because I think just the power of nature, we do often forget, don't we? And just like going outside and going for a simple walk can lift our spirits so much. And I guess in the world we're in now, you know, we can all be guilty, can't we, of staring at a screen too much, um, not getting outdoors and perhaps particularly as well with lockdown and everything else. But It's amazing, isn't it, as well? It's making me think as well a bit of the concept of beauty hunting. And I can't remember who coined that, but talking as well about with eating disorders, where in a way we can often become so focused on the body or kind of what's on a screen. But again, going outside into the natural world, just with fresh eyes, childlike eyes almost, and having that kind of wonder and amazement again, just to really appreciate the wonder of nature. Totally. Yeah, it's something that I find it very, very healing. And it's just it's just going back to the senses, right? Like, how does it feel mm. touching the cold water, you know? And I do that a lot now that we moved to Brighton, you know, that the water is really cold. <laughs> so I sometimes, like, say, you know, like, touching, like, when I when I jump into the sea, I just, like, feel like, oh, how does it feel that in my body, you know? And, like, and it's just it's just, just a wonder. And I call it this, like, kinesthetic awareness, right? Like, there's... Yeah. This body sensations, you know, how does it feel touching like a tree? You know, a lot of people now talk about like hugging trees, you know, how does it feel that? And like you said, it takes us a bit out of like when thinking about eating disorders, out of our own sort of story and all the feelings and help us see and touch and feel what's around us. Mm. And which which I think it's it's extreme, yeah, it's really, really powerful. And like looking at the details, you know, one of my teachers used to say, like, look at the details, Maria, when you're when you're walking, you know, when you go for a walk, the birds, what's the sound of the birds, you know? Mm. And what kind of movement does it represent? So it's kind of it also has like the life of process, this beautiful, playful energy that mm. help us sort of tap into curiosity and the creativity and I never had imagined that I could have been able to draw like a rib cage you know because I always sort of <laughs> judged my art and it was I'm pretty sure it was not nice but it just resonated with me you know and in the end that's that's what matters it helps us also like you know we're talking about eating disorders the perfectionism right and the expectations that we have and how good we want to be all the time and and this work give us a bit of like flexibility when it comes to that but that's why I'm aware and like I said at the beginning this is not something for people that are going through like early stages you know it's more Mm -hmm. about when it comes to like the end or when it comes to having an eating and eating disorder behavior yeah so because some people might not even be ready to tap into that and it could ever it could even be worse for them so that's why it's really important to I usually talk to women and explain it to them and even like I show them like an example and, and I put myself as a model in that way. And, and if it resonates with them, great. But if not, then then that's OK. Sure. So, yeah, it's about sort of timing and feeling ready and perhaps being sort of enough along the recovery road that you feel, I guess, that some sense of sort of safety and just ability to trust the process a bit more isn't it like whereas I guess if you're just extremely unwell it just might not be physically or mentally doable totally yeah 
And like you said, because we're aiming to find safety in our own bodies, you know, that trust. And if we're not ready, we don't want to push. We don't want to speed up the process because we're all in different journeys. And it, and it happens a lot also, you know, like a lot of clients tend to compare themselves a lot with other people, you know, when they hear stories. And especially happens a lot, you know, with anorexia and we talk about group work. So that's why we have to be, yeah, we have to be quite careful. But I do feel like, especially now, there have been a few studies looking at like the impact that this type of work could have when it comes to body image and body satisfaction. And what we want is, you know, the person to have a, a realistic and healthy idea, you know, construction, mental construction, spiritual and emotional concept of themselves. Mm, sure. Well, Maria, it's been so helpful just to hear about this because I think it's obviously like just another really valuable tool that can be a real sort of channel for healing for people. So I really appreciate you just talking so much about it. And could you tell us, like, if people want to find out more about you and the work you do, or even more as well about the Tamalpa life art process, where do they go to find out more? Sure. So when it comes to the Tamalpa, to Tamalpa, to the life art process, the website, the website is very, very good. And there are lots of information and they're doing lots of trainings online. And they also do workshops that I tend to join a lot to keep, you know, the learning going so I do recommend people to check them out they have amazing teachers most of them now the teachers that are doing the online workshops are based in California so sometimes the time is a bit of an issue but they're like amazing teachers so I do recommend that and my website is a work in progress but I'm also coming up with my newsletter so if you if someone is interested please do reach out via social media email and my my newsletter will be out in the in the next few days so so yeah that would be the best way to reach me out okay brilliant well that's fantastic maria and i'll make sure i'm gonna put all those details in the show notes so people can get in touch if they want to find out more so thank you so much for coming on today i really appreciate you know you sharing your story and to sort of telling us more about the tamalpa life art process and just how it can really help and support and people with their healing so thank you very much no thanks a lot for having me it's been such a wonderful experience this and like i've said it's, i just find it very precious and sacred space it's to share this that I, it's really close to my heart so thanks a lot for giving me the space harry i really appreciate it okay thank you so i hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as i did and do go and check out all of maria's details in the show notes if you're not following me already do seek me out on instagram at the eating disorder therapist and if you're looking for further support with your relationship with food do visit my website which is the eating disorder therapist.co.uk and it's got information about my breakthrough days and online courses thank you so much for listening today and i look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon